Thanks for tuning in to the Pacey Performance Podcast this morning. I'm delighted to welcome Matt Valley. So welcome to the podcast, mate. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. So it was a bit of a stalking after Steve's uh, MDT conference, webinar conference, which I thought was excellent, and so was your presentation. So thank you for that. Thank you. But if anyone didn't tune into that, firstly, I'd recommend they do because it was a great presentation uh, along with 250 others or whatever he managed to pull together. Um, but anyone that doesn't tune in and get a bit of a, a brief background on yourself, do you want to give us, um, yeah, brief background, where you've been, what you've been doing, and what you're doing at Latrobe? Yeah, no worries. So um, I've probably come a bit full circle um, in terms of in terms of where I've been. Um, I actually started out my education at RMIT, which is a university down in, in Melbourne, which is actually about a kilometre away from Latrobe. Um where I've ended up working now. So I did my undergraduate in a uh, degree, it was human movement, um, and then actually took a couple of years off, um, maintained my experience doing an internship with the Victorian Institute of Sport, which I then um, continued just in a voluntary sense for a year or two afterwards, but uh, worked full time in a, in a gym in the city for a couple of years. And then decided that, you know, I wanted to um, go back to university, uh, further education so I went to Victoria University where I did uh, an honours year um, and that was a research project using GPS um, with the uh, we say soccer I will still say football the football team um, from the Victorian Institute of Sport so uh, back then I think the project was using GPS on the team over six games which when I look at that now, it doesn't seem like a lot, but back then that was that was something that really, um, a few people had done it, but, but not really in youth football. Um, so that was the honours project. And then on the back of that, decided that I liked research, um, went and did a, a PhD, um, was supervised by, by Rob Orgy. Um, so he was located uh, working at the, between VU and the Western Bulldogs at the time. Um, so we're actually based out at, um, Wittenover, which is where the Western Bulldogs Australian Football Club uh, train. So did my PhD there, which focused on um, GPS, predominantly acceleration um, from an applied sense. But there was a final study, which was very much more lab-based, um, deeper physiology um, using a non-motorized treadmill. Um, but, but really since then, I've stayed on the applied, the applied track. Um, so on the back of that, I was lucky enough to get a role at Victoria University lecturing um, and I was there for about three years uh, and then made the move over to the Aspire Academy in Qatar um, where I worked just for under three years as um, the role was research coordinator for the football performance and science department um, also uh, one of the senior sports scientists there um, just helping with, with the testing and supporting all the teams um, within the academy and, and within Qatar. Um, and then on the back of that, uh, me and my wife came back to Melbourne and got a role at La Trobe, um, where I am now. So, yeah, my current role is um, just lecturing um, there, mainly in the field of um, performance analysis and analytics. Um, yeah, and that kind of brings us up to date on, on where I am now. Nice, mate. So research still going on? Yeah, yeah research yeah. still going on. Um, so I've currently got, um, we've got a link with Melbourne City. So they're a partner with the uh, with the university. So we're talking about getting some some projects up and coming with, with them. Um, but at the same time, um, I've got a couple of PhD students who have, probably started within the last um, couple of months to, to a year or so um, and really starting to get back into the research. Last year I was in a role where I was um, I was discipline lead for sport and exercise science at Latrobe, um, which, which was a great experience just to get uh, a handle on the management side of things, um, it, but not as research active. So I still managed to collaborate internationally, people like Steve Barrett, James Malone, uh, and so on, which has always been, um, you know, really exciting to do, especially because they've got, um, you know, the football connections over over in the UK. Um, but yeah, really gearing up for hopefully um, a, a good year research-wise um, 
as, as I mentioned just before the podcast started, um, the challenge is probably now looking at what the research landscape looks like given everything that's going on at the moment, um, which I guess we're, we're still really discovering. Do you think it will change dramatically? Do you think it'll be there'll be funding issues or anything like that? Uh, I think obviously from a from a club level, it's really challenging because there's been you know we look at the um, the AFL, the Australian um, Football League, and there's been a large number of staff that have yeah. um, been stood down for for the foreseeable future. Um, so that is is a challenge, um, and I don't want to really be prioritising research over people being actually able to do their jobs. Um, I think that's what that needs to be the most important thing. Um, what, what I will say where people have been able to stay on um, during this time, um, you know, talking to some people, they've been able to use it to their advantage to have a bit of downtime, to maybe upskill in certain areas, um, be able to look at their processes. Often in sport, it can be we get through the season, we take a break, we come back, but we haven't had as much time as we would always like to be able to plan. Um, hopefully this gives people who, who are still able to um, stay with their, their respective organisations um, the opportunity to do that planning. Um, and some of that could include having um, you know, a research direction or reaching out to people to help. Um, but I don't want to be prioritising research over people being able to do their their day to day task in the sports science area. What, what I will say, which is a challenge, um, I think in in sports science, maybe not necessarily at the elite level, but one of the challenges that we've had is you know, it's fantastic. There's always a fantastic opportunity for undergraduate or postgraduate students to be involved in in club levels to gain experience. And I know one of the issues with the internships is always the um, the voluntary and what, what constitutes a paid internship. Um, it's really difficult because we want people to get experience, but we want them to have experience where they're being appropriately supervised, ideally by someone, a full-time sports scientist or strength and conditioning coach that's with the club. Um, now, that was already a challenge where in some cases, maybe more at an amateur level, you would have clubs that, aren't able to have that supervision there and rather than having a, a full-time or a part-time sports scientist or, or s &C coach, they'll, they'll have an, an intern there. Um, great experience, but also, you know, how much are they able to learn in that role? So one of the, one of the possible risks I see when we all come back into this space, given that a lot of clubs will be in that, uh, not as they'll be worse off a little bit financially mm -hmm. is what happens in that space you know what's is there going to be more reliance on unpaid internships i think that's something that we need to pay close attention to um i think yeah, and it is starting to get attention definitely in australia exercise sports science australia are doing a lot of really good work in that space um and i, I think similarly with um, um bases over in the uk yes um but it is something that's just based on the last few months, I think when we come back into the sporting area, it will be something that has been impacted. So it's something we need to think about. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Absolutely agree. So one thing that are the, the main topic of your presentation uh, for, for Steve and the performance MDT, one thing that caught my eye was the, the discussion around the reliability and validity of specifically GPS devices, what you, what you spoke about. But I guess although that might be used here as a bit of context, I think that can be probably transferred to a number of different technologies, whatever it may be. Mm. But just to dumb it down for simpletons like myself, validity, validity and reliability, why in terms of technology in sports, technology uh, in elite environments, whether well, elite, sub-elite environments, why should we be, why should we be interested in that? Mm. Um, why should we care? Yeah. Um. I guess there's a few, it's, it's just kind of multifactorial. From, from the validity aspect, we're looking at does does the device measure what it's intended to measure? Um, and that that's probably one part of it. So for example, um, and as you said, this applies to well any technology, not just tracking technology, but if we if we use tracking technology, and again, I use something like GPS as an example, um, if GPS is giving you a measure of 
um, the distance an athlete has covered is if they cover 10 meters, does it say they've covered 10 meters? So what, what's the validity of that system? Um, but then from the reliability aspect, it's, it's almost more important. So um, if we run 10 meters wearing this device over and over again, does it consistently say that we've done 10 metres each time? Um, so, you know, I, I think that reliability is almost more important than the validity because then we're using this information to make decisions on our athletes. We're using it to compare what they've done in training, what they've done in games and so on. Um, so, so I do think the validity reliability is very important. Um, I didn't touch on it too much in my, in my talk. I kind of moved past that, but... Just, just some of the things I think need to really come to people's attention when we talk about validity and reliability with this technology. Um, and I'll kind of give two sides to the story here. The, the first one is every time there is a different, uh, what, what needs to kind of be assessed. So we've got a device, uh, GPS, it measures distance, it measures velocity, um, we can look at latitude, longitude, so you get some positional information as well. So when we talk about the validity and reliability of that device, we're talking about the validity and reliability for each different measure it assesses. It's not only its ability to measure distance. Uh, we also want to look at it to measure, um, you know, especially now we're starting to really use this stuff for tactical analysis, um, position, and so on. So that's one part of it. Then every different model, every different change to how that data is output really should be reassessed. Um, we've seen you know, some of the research from, um, from especially Martin Boucher showed that when they updated the firmware, um, there were big changes to um, the acceleration metrics that were calculated. Um, so each device is different, each update to a device from a manufacturer is different. Within the device, we have different types of data that, um, or measures that will be different. But then, you know, we could go and we could look at the distance derived from a device and we could say, well, we looked at the raw data and this was accurate um, or this wasn't that accurate. But then what happens is we filter that data yeah. and that's perfectly fine because um, the raw data can be noisy. We want to improve it. We want to make it more accurate. So it should be filtered. Um, so when we're talking about the validity or reliability of a device, often it's the raw data that gets looked at. But at the end of the day, maybe that's good for the, for the researchers, or the academics, but most people in industry will use the software provided by the company um, and that data will be filtered. So potentially their um, information is, is more reliable, could be less. We, we don't know because we haven't looked at that. So it's an important consideration. But also recently, I've, I've been thinking more and more about this. At the end of the day, clubs are going to use the devices that they have. So we can't, it's, validity reliability is very important. But for these clubs, we also need to help them use the data that they've got. Um, and so then, given the limitations of these devices in terms of their validity and reliability, um, and this is kind of where, I guess, my, my talk about the metrics came into play. What metrics are you looking at and what do they actually translate to? Because just because something's valid and reliable, we then can filter that. We can get a metric such as, um sprint efforts so what do we mean when we talk about sprint efforts with your devices um so it, it can be really complex part of me the academic in me always wants to see validity reliability information but if we're always waiting for that and we know that when research comes out there's always a delay mm -hmm. um, and technology if we had a device that gave us everything we wanted now then there's going to be no real evolution of technology. And this is this is the really, I think, important consideration, especially from a research perspective for people. Um, what we looked at years ago, we look at it and we go, okay, well, that wasn't necessarily 
accurate now, but it was the best we had at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I think some of the old match analysis studies um, were reporting that we players were covering uh, about 800 metres a game at more than 30 kilometres an hour. Now, now we know that that's not going to be, that wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. It was probably, you know, down to validity, reliability of the device. But at the time, that was the best that we had. Um, I look back at some of my early research, especially around the the, um, the acceleration information reported. Though the number of efforts that we reported in, in some of my early work wouldn't even be comparable to what we do now because we've progressed from there. So technology is currently evolving. So I think we need to acknowledge that technology always has its limitations. It's got its error, but it's not necessarily wrong what we're doing. We're using the best technology possible. Otherwise, the option is to use nothing because we don't have the perfect product or we finally get the perfect product and we just don't worry about evolving it any further. Um, so, yeah, mm-hmm. I've, pro- I've probably gone off on a bit of a tangent. There. No, 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 that's, that's really good. That's really interesting. Um, I suppose it's like anything. If you look back five years and what you did five years ago was still good and you think, oh, yeah, absolutely nailed it five years ago, nailed it ten years ago, you probably haven't evolved and you probably haven't moved on yourself, whether it's research or it's just general work, you know, um, writing, etc. But in terms of this process and going through this process of establishing um, reliability and validity of a certain product, and more and more, and just touching on one of your points, I think these kind of purchases, especially big purchases like a GPS, may even fall in the into the hands of financials. And people may be given a device that isn't necessarily their choice because it's from a commercial angle. But so that, that, that again plays into the fact that, you know, people are just given this data and to, to understand what they've been given is obviously important. But going through that process themselves in terms of their environment with their units, with their players, and there's been the, the FIFA study recently which has obviously got a lot of um, traction as well. But if people wanted to do this, themselves like i say their environment their players how hard is that to do and should people be doing that yeah it's it's a it's a tricky one because i think anyone anyone can do it if they've just got to have the right so they've got to have the time to be able to do it they need to have the the know-how of what that what they're doing um one thing, and one thing I'm really big on in, in across all types of research, when we, when we publish our research, especially from a validation, reliability, general match analysis papers, I think one of the most important areas is what we put in our methods because our research should be reproducible. So if people see a study that they like, a validation study, they go, that's really good. Um, I, I thought that gave a really clear idea of um, the limitations or where the de- what the device can do. They should be able to then follow that methodology, provided they have the right type of equipment and replicate it. Um, I think validity reliability studies are pretty good with their methods. They are quite detailed. Um, but when we're looking at probably our more descriptive studies on how we've determined our metrics and so on, that's where it falls falls down a bit, but that's probably for a bit a bit later on. If people wanted to be performing these kind of assessments, I guess they've got to know what they want to look at. You know, do they want to see how accurate the device is for measuring distances? Most of the time it's a mixture of distance and, uh, and speed, velocity. Um, now, you know, traditionally, a lot of the assessments there were done using timing gates. I, I do think we're kind of past the the timing gate um, method, and and it calls for something a bit more robust. You know, um, the the initial start of, part of the FIFA study, um, the stuff that Daniel Link has been doing. They've used Vicon, which is fantastic. You know, gold standard there, but it's not accessible to everybody. So, you know. What are the options there? Maybe linking with a university who could perform that research, but it, it probably comes down to time. Mm-hmm. Do these clubs have time to do it? And let's say you do it at the start of the season. 
how do you know next season you're not getting a firmware update which is going to need to do it again and again and again um what i quite like and this is um there's a study by uh, matt tavener um where they actually looked at interchangeability of different systems um and i think that could be quite useful okay it's not going to necessarily tell you about the validity and reliability of your devices but if we have practitioners who are faced with maybe two different situations. One, they've been told, okay, we're maybe we're cutting costs or we've got more money to spend and we're changing the technology that we're using. Okay, they have to go from one set of data that they're familiar with to a completely, potentially completely different set of data. So what's the interchangeability of that information? What does that look like? The other scenario is that, you know, they go from club to club and the club that they've moved to already has a technology that they're not familiar with. So that's much more straightforward to do as long as you have the different types of technology. And then it's just a matter of, you know, if, if it was GPS, so I would say GPS, not accelerometer, but if it was GPS, I'd be confident putting multiple units on, a, on an individual. You know, we just make sure that there's not gonna be any satellite interference um because it's not the accelerometer it's not going to be affected it's gps data so it's not really going to be affected by being on the left or right shoulder um it, it's probably giving more of a global indication of, of the body just get somebody to run through a range of movements and then see how they compare you could even have someone do it within, during a game if you wanted to um that that said i don't think we always need to be assessing our devices in a game situation. The device doesn't know that you're playing a game. The device knows that you're you're moving. When we, if we take a blood sample from a soccer player, you know, they don't have to be playing soccer to get an assessment of, of what's happening there. It, it They don't have to be juggling the ball. So I, I see something similar with this device. If you want to know if how accurate it is when somebody's sprinting, get them to sprint it doesn't have to be in a game they may not even sprint in the game you get them to play anyway um but i think that interchangeability is easier to do um and could be more effective okay it's not going to tell you about validity reliability but it will tell you about the differences you're seeing in the data that you're going to be using day to day mm -hmm. and that and that maybe especially for the bigger clubs over here when they've got a match solution camera solution and they've got a training solution with the gps so yeah. yes the interchangeability that's happening twice yeah. a week sometimes yeah yeah so with the i know companies put companies will put a white paper out and that'll show something that i don't suppose they put it out if they didn't want it to to show people what they wanted to show them and then you've got obviously peer-reviewed research in different scenarios so how difficult is it for practitioners to actually decipher what is applicable to them in terms of this information that they're collecting and what isn't for the FIFA study been an example with a big stadium. Okay. Well, we don't use it in a big stadium. We use it only for training on a big mm -hmm. open field. How applicable is that to us? It is tough between white papers, between research, between, um, you know, for example, the information coming out from FIFA study. Um, I think the biggest, I still think the biggest challenge is, the time it takes to do that study and get that information out there without that being superseded by new technology. Yeah. Um, I guess if you're looking at it from a stadium point of view, that's your worst case scenario. Whereas if you've got a training pitch, which is out in open space, it may look different um, and potentially better, hopefully better. Um, I, it's it's a really big challenge and that that's why as I mentioned before, more and more, I and I do think validity reliability is really important, but I also think maybe we just need to start looking at understanding the data that we're using, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. So that that's where, and again, we'll talk about it later, linking things to video, actually having an idea of what your information looks like. Um, now, now, I do tend to look at this stuff more from a, performance analysis point of view than a, than a workload point of view. So I know that that's where there are a lot more decisions made on, sorry, on training load and, and so on. Um, 
and and that's a really important one from a reliability point of view when you're making decisions there. Um, but re even reliability of a device is much, it's really difficult to determine because if I went and ran 200 metres 10 times in a row, I haven't replicated the exact run 10 times, you know. Um, so if especially we're looking at uh, my velocity or my speed throughout that run, it, it's going to change. So the reliability part's really hard without some kind of maybe robotic device, but then are we overthinking things? Yeah. Um, so it's... I haven't really given you an answer here, but I think it's because it's so it's so complex, yeah. Um, and because now we've got so many technologies, the software is changing, the way we analyze our data is changing, um, where we train, where we play, is always going to be different between clubs, um, between continents, and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so hopefully. Maybe the next little bit that we talk about is a little bit more simple, but I'm guessing it may also bring up its its own challenges. But in terms of GPS tracking and using that as an example with the hundreds and hundreds of metrics that are available for people, how do practitioners wade through that and pick out the ones that are most relevant for them to collect on their athletes? It's a really good point, and it's a, it's a challenge, I think, for, for a lot of people, um, especially because each different manufacturer or type of technology will want to do something slightly different. So all of a sudden we can be presented with a technology that offers over a hundred different metrics. Um, so which ones do we choose? Most people I've seen talk about what they use are now going for the less is more approach. So they may pick out two or three um, metrics. And my question is then always, why those metrics, what are they using them for? Um, I think we have a lot of, not a lot, but there are, there are people who maybe are picking their metrics because they've seen it reported in research or they're just ones that they've heard about and they're familiar with, um, you know, the basic total distance, uh, high speed running, sprinting, low speed running, accelerations, decelerations. So they're probably the ones they feel more comfortable with. But I think we always need to go back and ask, why are we looking at these met why the metrics we've got why are we looking at them is it from a training load point of view is it from um in pre-season is it from an intervention point of view we actually want to see if we can improve our athletes in a type of running that we're doing are we using it to monitor our athletes during testing um from a match point of view you know what's what's the information we're getting from that is it maybe not around training load now, but is it more context specific that we can provide the coaches and the support staff so they can be more specific with certain training drills or so on? So um, I, I think it's a challenge for people because there is so many different metrics available, but I think we always need to go back and ask, why am I collecting this? What is it going to be answering for me? Yeah, one thing that I always come back to when I, I, I've had chat chat to people about this in the past is my experience working for catapult mm. and it was only probably later as i've re reflected on that and some of the the chats we had of when people were taking on uh, catapult as a, as a technology and the amount of i don't want to sound disrespectful to people but there was a number of clubs who definitely took it on without actually knowing what they were going to do with it when they got it it was just because they'd, they'd heard about other people getting it and it was like, get these guys in ASAP, get it on the lads. What does it look like? Okay, yeah, that looks really good. Like, let's get it. Mm. And it's without actually having that really solid question of what they wanted to answer. And GPS was going to answer that for them or they thought it was. That that, that process had been missed out and they'd, they'd, they'd leapfrogged that, which I guess is pretty, pretty a common thing with all technologies. It, and even, even goes, you know, similar thing we can see during testing. For example, ask people what tests that if they have time to be able to perform tests on their athletes, what tests they perform. I would think we'd see something similar. Why yeah. do you do a sprint test? There, there would be a lot of people who do a sprint test because they know how to do a sprint test, or they were taught that sprint testing is important. But are they actually using? Are they using it to determine maximal sprint speed? And then from that, 
work out a relative threshold for their athletes. Um, so there's a justification on why you do the test. But I also think, similar to this, there's a lot of people who do that test because, well, these are the four or five tests that people always do, so we'll do them each year and, you know, meet our, meet our KPIs. So I think it's why we always need to question, and especially, you know, this goes back again to having so much data available, do we need to do everything that we're doing? There should be a purpose. There should be a, a justification and a purpose for why we're collecting what we're collecting, why we're doing what we're doing. And we need to have that time to be able to stop and think about that. So you mentioned, mentioned there about thresholds, and that was my next point. How do people, and what is the process for people to go through, to especially like the high-speed thresholds, for example, to actually identify what is going to be right for them in terms of setting them thresholds? Yeah. And this is probably the third time that I've <laughs> again it can be different for each person it depends on what their question is going to be um i know that in in research there's a huge push to, uh, a lot of the time for standardization during my phd i actually um it, it never got published but i wrote a an opinion article and um it was i think it was titled um you know match analysis the need for standardization and, and I reflect on that now and I actually disagree with a lot of what I wrote. I, great, standardization may be important in the academic sense because it makes it easier to compare different um, studies and different sets of data and so on. But I think at a club, a club level and a practitioner level, are you just using what other people have used or are you gonna do something that's, again, answering the question that you have? I think as long as you're using something and you understand why you're using that it's fine so for example um, if you want to determine a, a sprint threshold okay are you going to assess sprinting over 40 meters over 60 meters um, are you going to say that your threshold is going to be relative to the athlete maybe 80 percent of maximal sprint speed um, you can't go too close to a maximal sprint speed otherwise you're you're not going to see that in the game um, or you'll see very, you'll see very low number of sprints. So we then need to balance between actually getting information. Um, so you know, if you set a th sprint threshold so high that you only see one every fourth game, then is that actually useful? Or do you set it a little bit lower? You know that that's not necessarily their top speed, but it's going to give you a bit more information about when somebody is getting closer to their maximal sprint speed. Um, same with acceleration, you know, are you going to assess it over five metres or 10 metres? Um, are you going to go with 80% or 90% of your, of your maximal acceleration, um, maximal rate of acceleration? So, you know, whenever I'm reviewing a paper, I'm quite happy to accept different ways of people coming to these thresholds as long as they justify what their method was or what their rationale was. I, I, I won't go back to them and say, no, this has to be the same as how these guys have done it because we all have different approaches. That That's competitive sport. If we're all doing the same thing, it takes the competition out of what we're doing. Um, so so out, of, out of interest, Matt, what would be a justification for choosing a certain threshold? What what process do people go through to get, that, get to that? So if I use those two examples of um, sprinting or accelerating. So when when we you know, originally, when we picked a, what we thought was a, a appropriate threshold for maximal acceleration, I think it was around about, you know, 2.78 or close to three meters per second squared. I think, I think 2.78 ended up being like 10 kilometers per hour per hour. And that's why that was used originally. Um, I think we maybe had done some, some testing um, with, with some of the AFL players at the time. But, you know, it was kind of this is what we've picked for now. And then, you know, similar to a lot of the other thresholds, it's kind of what people have, have stuck with. Um, recently, when I've looked at it, um, I've kind of gone off uh, acceleration over 10 metres and uh, around 80% of um, that maximal acceleration. But again, there's a bit of a justification there, but it, it still is a little bit arbitrary. Um, what I will say, though, is 
I'm, I'm a bit harder with acceleration, but with maximal sprint speed, for example, often we're determining that via timing gates. So, you know, we may do a 40, 50, 60 metre sprint um, and work out the quickest time over 10 metres. Um, but I think more and more now we can start to use the technology that we're actually going to be tracking our athletes with to determine what that, in this case, maximal speed would be. And to me, that makes sense because if your GPS, when you're doing a 60 metre sprint, says that your maximal speed is, um, you know, seven and a half metres per second, and your timing gates say that it's eight metres per second, then if we look at 80% of our maximal sprint speed, it's actually going to be different because we've used the maximal speed from the timing gates rather than the GPS. So at least if we're using the same device that we're then going to be applying that threshold to, we, we I think that just gives us a bit more quality assurance in what we're doing there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, again, I think people will have lots of different ways of justifying the thresholds that they've chosen. Um, sprinting generally going to be based on maximal speed acceleration based on the maximal rate of acceleration um it is trickier because are we looking at accelerations from a static start versus a moving start and so on which you know opens up a whole another barrel of fish um high speed running okay are we going to relate that to um high intensity so then do we link it to some type of test where we can work out um you know, people's maximal aerobic speed or anything like that. Um, so there's, there's lots of different tests, lots of different ways of people coming to a conclusion on this is why they're going to pick these thresholds. And I think as long as they're clear and they have a rationale behind it, and that rationale, if they read it in a paper and say, I really like the way these guys did that, that's how I'm, that's what I'm going to adopt, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But when they say, I'm going to use this paper and they didn't justify it and you know, you, you follow your papers back and back and back, you get to the original article and there was no justification for yeah. the threshold that was used, but because <clears throat> it's a highly cited paper, all of a sudden everybody's using this threshold because it's the threshold everybody uses. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah I understand. Um, so filtering was another part of your presentation. Talk to us a little bit about that. Is that is that is is it my interpretation or is that a little bit of a murky... The murky world that people uh, kind of question of what's been filtered and what hasn't and how they do it how they don't do it how different companies differ all that kind of stuff it's again it's a tricky one because i think i think there can be sometimes that perception of filtering being you said murky waters but i filtering is it's a good thing mm-hmm. you know it, it's something that should should happen because Hopefully, the intention of the filtering is to improve the quality of the data that we've got, you know. Um, so filtering shouldn't be seen as, as a negative. Um, I think it's something that should happen. Where it becomes difficult is when there's not transparency in how that filtering goes on because I go back to being able to reproduce research. You need to know the steps that people have taken to get to what they're reporting. Um, I think I spoke in my um, in my presentation about an article by um, Damien Harper where they did a, a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at um, high-intensity acceleration and deceleration efforts. And they had quite a bit, uh, quite a strict exclusion criteria. So I think they, they got down to, I think it was around about 17 articles. Um, but from those articles, you know, not all of them, gave the full information on how they were determining their acceleration efforts. Um, And so then when you go to compare them and you see that some of them might be, um, okay, over the course of a football match, there were 30 efforts performed and here it's 100 efforts performed. That doesn't surprise me because they've maybe used different technologies, they've used different filters, so that output is going to be quite different. Um, I think it's one of the biggest things that, gets neglected in what we do because even if we go and work out the validity and reliability of a device, 
that information still then gets filtered in some way. And that filtered information may then have a whole lot of options applied to it for in the case of effort detection. You know, so if we if we go through the process of um, effort detection from, from an acceleration point of view, okay, so with GPS, we have um, our, our velocity information, um, which, which is coming from the, the Doppler shift method. From that, okay, we've got velocity, which then gets um, derived into acceleration. So the first step then is how are we deriving acceleration from velocity? Are we just looking at um, the change in velocity over time from sample one to sample two? Are we using a wider interval? You know, sample two, uh, one to sample two, sample one to sample three, uh, which is, you know, crude method of filtering itself. Are we putting a filter on our velocity data and then putting a filter on our acceleration data? Um, once we've then actually got that acceleration data, how are we detecting our efforts? So we, we've got to pick a rate of acceleration where that constitutes the start of the effort. But then how do we detect the end of that effort? Okay, so we need, for the effort to be real, we need a minimum amount of time above that threshold. But then do we say that you complete your acceleration when you drop below that threshold? Say the common one is three meters per second squared. However, you know, we can still be accelerating um, below three meters per second squared. Um, so do we use the cutoff for that effort as when we drop below three or when we drop below zero, um, when we just don't accelerate at all? Two different ways to do it. You know, one might result in very short acceleration efforts, which are one, one and a half, two steps. The other one might be longer acceleration efforts um, over four or five meters or so. It depends then what your question is, what you want to look at. If you're going above three meters per second squared until below, that's probably makes more sense from a training load point of view. But if you're looking at it from a performance analysis point of view and you want to see, okay, situations where someone's had to maximally accelerate and I want to see a full acceleration effort there as a coach may perceive that effort, then maybe the other method's more appropriate. Mm -hmm. So all these things come into play when we talk about filtering our data um, the, the data processing itself, I think, and I think it's fair enough to a degree. From an academic and a research side, obviously, where we pull out that data, we play with it, we tend to analyze it ourselves. Where I think we're quite, you know, someone releases commercial software, and often we just want to do our own thing and go around it, um, or come to the same conclusion as that software analyzing it ourselves to have a greater understanding of what's what's happening um, but from a practitioner level you know that's a, it's a lot more information that they may not have time to understand but the implications of you know even just some simple things like what type of filter you're using what minimum duration you're setting for your efforts um, most I don't know any technology that allows you to set a minimum time for the effort to have concluded. Um, but all, all those considerations are going to affect their data, but I don't think everyone's going to have a clear understanding of that. And that's where it's probably the role of, um, you know, your upcoming sports scientists. So we can start to embed that into what we're teaching them if they're going through um, university degrees or, um, you know, the researchers to combine with clubs to give them more information there, to give them a clearer picture on how they're, they're analysing or filtering their data. Um, what I will say, though, is from an academic point of view, it, we do need to get better at that, you know, reporting that information and detailing that information, especially if we've just got a descriptive study, um, you know, just because the study is descriptive doesn't mean that you don't have as um, detailed a method section. And I think that falls on the authors to have a better understanding there. But also I think, um, you know, the, the reviewer community to be holding people to a higher standard. Um, I think a response of, 
well, this paper didn't provide that information. I don't think that's good enough. You know, I think we should constantly be looking to improve on what we're doing. So, um, yeah, kind of gone off a little bit there. But no, 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 but no it's really interesting. Don't it's, worry. It's complex. I think it's often neglected. Um, but I think that's because it's quite difficult to understand and we need to really start being a bit more accountable with what we do with our data. Yeah, no, don't worry about that. It's, it's really interesting. So one thing I want to cover before I let you go and get on with your evening, um, next steps with performance analysis and um, yeah, practicing research, what would you, what would you say would be the, the kind of next things coming along or what, how you recommend people um, going about performing research? And you've mentioned some already, of course. Yeah, for me, probably leads on with what we were talking about is mm -hmm. is understanding the metrics that we're looking at i'm a very visual person i i need to see if, if someone tells me okay there's a sprint effort performed in a game i would actually like to see that you know i know what that will probably look like but it gives me confirmation of what this sprint effort um represented now i can then add context to it um from a game situation but, and I will get to the context bit in a minute, but just from that understanding our actual metrics, our accelerations, our decelerations, our change of direction, anyone who's reporting that kind of information, I think it would be incredibly useful for them to try and marry that up to video to see what, what the data they're making these decisions on actually looks like. Mm -hmm. I, we had a few years ago um, the paper that uh, we did with... Um, with James Malone, Arnie Jaspers, and uh, Werner Helsen. So we used some data from the, the Netherlands and we um, looked at different ways of um, playing with the metrics, changing the minimum duration, filtering, and so on. But while we were doing that, we also um, married up each way of detecting these efforts with video during a game. And I just remember one of the things that stuck in my head was, okay, this is when an acceleration effort is meant to have occurred and you watch the video and the player's walking and they do a 180 degree turn and they keep walking and look they probably turn quick enough that for the device with the way it was being filtered true it was an acceleration effort but is that what people people then should should realize that so i think the next steps are really starting to link up the metrics that we're looking at with video and and Look, as I said, I talk about it more from a performance analysis point of view than a training load monitoring point of view. But I also think it would be useful there when when people say to me, "These are the uh, this is the acceleration deceleration load for the, for the week." If they're using efforts, sometimes I think that could be a little bit of a random number generator until you actually know what that looks like. Um, is it what you expect it looks like? But then, as a sports scientist you're then talking to the SNC, you're talking to the coach. So each support staff may perceive those efforts to be different as well. So the video integration is incredibly useful. A lot of companies are starting to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, it's just, and again, it's just ha the, the guys working at the clubs having time to be able to embed that. So I think research along that pathway, um, obviously research is now we've seen more and more people getting familiar with programs like using R, Python, MATLAB, and that probably provides a bit more flexibility to marry that up ourselves um, and try some innovative research there. So, you know, for me, the next step with performance analysis is really marrying up the um, the data that we're getting with, with video. If in just in that example, if you're as more sports scientists take this kind of information to coaches, again, to add context to the data they're providing in their reports, if they don't understand that that could be a situation, i.e. the 180 degree turn, that could cut, that could lose a coach, that they're, yeah. you're giving me this information and how many of them are there? Yeah. So that, that could, yeah, unless you know that and you can pinpoint that and justify why that's happened and why it may be an anomaly or whatever, that, yeah, that could... I can imagine that could lose a coach. Yeah. It, and then and then from there, once they understand it, you can then, and this is like, I can't wait till we're able to get to this point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's always these things that we need to do beforehand, but then let's start to actually analyse context to these movements. And 
And that's, I, I think I always use this video of, um, you know, the, well, the common phrase we have in a lot of our performance analysis research is sprinting and acceleration. It's really important because it'll help players be first to the ball or move past an opponent. Um, and there's been, you know, um, a couple of studies that have looked at that before goal scoring opportunities, the work by Oliver um, Faud, um, really good, good study ages ago, 2012. Um, so not a lot has been done since then where they looked at um, goals in the Bundesliga just from free to air video. Um, and the only thing is it was a subjective determination, but they identified whether players were sprinting beforehand. And that's great because it's linking sprinting to goal scoring. But how do we know, you know, I think of Australian rules football where players may rotate on and off um, the pitch six, seven times a game. When they get off the pitch, they sprint off the pitch. So <laughs> all of a sudden, there's seven or eight sprints that are they were, were they important in the context of the game? Well, maybe because the player needs to be off before the next one can come on. But, um, you know, I, I think I show a video of... Um, Adebayor scoring against um, Arsenal when he played for Manchester City. Oh, yes. City. Yeah. And, and he scores and he runs the full length of the pitch to celebrate in front of the, uh, the the Arsenal fans. And that's a massive sprint, you know. How important was it in the context of the game? Um, that's just one example. I think the change of direction stuff that you said would be really interesting. And that would obviously then influence the way we test change of direction as well. There's so many different tests. What are the common angles that we're actually changing direction during a game? The only thing is to get there, we need to be sure about how we measure acceleration. Then I think we can be sure about how we measure deceleration and then we measure them together, which is our change of direction. So we've, we've got to work systematically through it um, and then we can get to the context point of view. So there's a lot to be done there, um, but I think we'll start moving more, much more rapidly in this space. So I think it's, you know, it's quite exciting times ahead. Mm -hmm. So as we come up towards the hour, I want to just ask you one more thing before I let you go. So the, in, I mean, I spoke about GPS again to give context to a lot of this, but the, the, the increased use of the inertial sensors, which are in these GPS devices, do you see that as been the future of GPS to, to integrate these more and more? Um, or if not, where do you see the future of, of, uh, of player tracking? I see, if we look at what we've got at the moment, we've got GPS, we've got the inertial sensors, um, and we've got optical tracking and you know, coming through computer vision and so on. Um, I think... You know, the technology will evolve, but we'll still see, you know, for example, we're still we're still going to see GPS, in my opinion, for at least the next five or six years because um, clubs have them, they're familiar with them. They allow you to be on the pitch, uh, in, sorry, in the stadium, or if you travel, you can take them with you. So from the optical tracking system and the computer vision, I think that's that will be there in the future but it won't be the only thing that we use. Now with the inertial sensors, I think it goes, it goes back to what I was talking about, about understanding our metrics. At the moment, people are able to understand the information coming from GPS much easier than what comes from these inertial sensors. And so what we'll start to see now, which we've already, you know, people have been working on for you know, seven or eight years already with, with player load and um, things like that, but is more and more um, new metrics, I guess, that are coming from our inertial sensors, the accelerometers, magnetometers, gyroscopes, and so on. Um, so, you know, um, where, where Steve now is, you know, they've got the accelerometers mm -hmm. that go on each boot, which I think is really exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what's happening in that space. Um, You've got well, all the all the GPS have accelerometers built into them as well. Um, so it's understanding what we can get from those those systems. I think things will change, but I think the current three technologies we have are going to still be around for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, yeah, affordability comes into things for people as well. So can everybody move to an optical tracking system? 
not so much at the um, at the amateur level. Um, not the GPS are that cheap. Mm -hmm. um, accelerometers are a cheaper alternative, but especially at an amateur level, harder to comprehend, um, yes. depending on who you have in place. So I guess it just goes back to, to understanding the metrics that we've got and making sure that when we get information, we're clear on what it means and how we can use it. I think there's a place for all three technologies um, in the foreseeable future anyway. Amazing. Well, thanks, mate. Really appreciate that. If anyone wants to catch up with anything that we've discussed or anything else, where's the best place for people to go? Um, I'm, I'm happy for people to email me um, or, or get in touch with me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send you my email. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, I remember now, I always change my name too often. Um, <laughs> uh, it's m.barley at latrobe.edu.au. Um, they can message me through Twitter. I don't use Twitter as much as I probably should, yeah. uh, but it will come through. Um, but, but as you say on that, one of the really cool things, I think, about the area of research that I, I work in is I don't need to be face-to-face -face for a lot of it. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we've done have been international collaborations with people where, you know, we, we Zoom, we Skype, um, we share the screen, we see the data, transfer it, play around with it, send it back. So it's, it's helping people interpret what they're doing. Um, as I said, you know, a lot of it comes down to time for people. They don't have time to be able to look at their information as in depth as they would like. So, you know, that's where I see, and not just myself, all, all researchers and universities are there to be able to help and support people. Um, but yeah, I'm always happy to have a chat and, and really do invite people to get in, in touch. Um, yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you very much. So you've, I know you've said your uh, email address there, but if anyone wants confirmation of that, I'll, I'll, I'll get it from you and, uh, and pass it on should people want it. So thank you very much, Matt. Really appreciate your time and, uh, definitely check the, check out the, um, the presentation. I think it's on YouTube and probably Playmakers website as well, but yeah, really appreciate it, Matt. And I'll, uh, I'll chat to you soon. Have a good rest of your day. Uh, thank you. And thanks for having me. Uh, no, it's been great. Pleasure. Thanks mate. Sure.